Good day, uh, my name is David, this is Isaac, and today we'll be talking about our 3D printable metamaterial lens for terahertz optics, uh, this, which is our four-figure design project. Uh, this, our other team members are Edward Jin and Ian Siedelman, and our consultants were Michal Baishi and Dr. Uh, Safavi Naim. So just to give you an overview of the presentation, I'll give you the motivations behind uh, our project. And then I'll go into some technical background, both on metal materials as well as 3D printing. I'll talk about how those lead into our design goals as well as our specifications. And then uh, I'll detail some of the pre preliminary testing that we did on both the uh, printing and the uh, materials. Then we'll switch over to Isaac, who will give you the design process, the design flow, as well as the simulation and opt optimization aspects of the project. Uh, he'll report on the results of the prototype testing, as well as to give you an evaluation of the design. So uh, the terahertz uh, band is a section of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum uh, between microwave and infrared uh, frequencies. So it is typically from 100 gigahertz to one, 10 terahertz. It has many applications, particularly in high throughput communications, medical imaging, and uh, security. So uh, you can this is probably one of the most well-known examples of a terahertz application. This is the uh, full body scanners, the mil millimeter wave scanners used in uh, security for airports uh, by the Transport Security Administration in the United States. So this is one example of where terahertz is used in technologies. Uh, however, uh, terahertz technologies are generally uh, problematic due to uh, two reasons. Uh, the fact that op optical manipulation of terahertz uh, radiation is usually difficult, as well as the fact that many of the traditional optical materials are quite lossy at terahertz frequencies. So, metal materials uh, create non-traditional uh, optical properties uh, by through the use of metal structures. So, for example, um, whereas in a traditional lens it uses its material properties and geometry to focus the lens, so you can uh, see that. There's like a large uh, geometric curve on the traditional lens. A uh, metal material lens you, uh, replicate this same optical transformation function with through its meta structure. So, uh, the individual pillars on this meta material lens uh, rep replicate of the f uh, or induce a phase shift uh, localized to that particular area of the lens, and through the propagation of the uh, wave through uh, Maxwell's equations will eventually get a focusing effect at a particular focal point. So what is significant about this is that significantly less material can be used for this uh, metamaterial lens, which is significant for terahertz, as uh, we can expect much less uh, power loss through the metamaterial lens versus the traditional lens. So uh, 3D printing, uh, current commercial 3D printing is able to reliably build small structures, and this is this makes it a particularly interest for terahertz metamaterials as uh, the Side, the resolution of the commercially available printers are suitable for making terahertz uh, structures that uh, work in the terahertz range, uh, as well as the other advantages of 3D printing are that it is, has low cost uh, as, and that we can have a, a relatively quick uh, design and a prototyping uh, cycle compared to uh, other manufacturing methods such as uh, molding or lithography. So this folds into our uh, project, which so uh, we are tr we tr we're trying to create a uh, terahertz uh, a new terahertz lens for uh, that focuses terahertz radiation. And the two core components of this project is that we'll be using a metal material designed to reduce the power loss of the lens, as well as three D printing for rapid and cheap prototyping. Uh, from this, we can get our customer requirements is uh, specifically that it should have a similar focusing function comparable to that of commercial terahertz lenses, such as ones made from uh, polyethylene and uh, high resistance flow zone silicon. It should have, uh, from, our, from our special features, it should have a higher transmission efficiency as well as a lower unit cost per lens. From this, we can uh, transfer that into functional specifications. So we. Uh, designed this lens to work at frequencies from 75 to 110 gigahertz. Uh, its thickness and diameter should be no more than 10 and 50 millimeters respectively with a focal ratio of around one. And the uh, res full width half maximum response to a point source should be no, no greater than 1.2 times the theoretical diffraction limit. 
And the focusing efficiency, that is the ratio of the focused power to the uh, input power, should be greater than 70%. So how do we make sure that our 3D printing process can actually replicate the uh, design uh, we have for the lens? So uh, the, the, the 3D printing for this project was done on a Form Labs Form 2 printer uh, supplied by our Professor Baichi. Uh, we printed various test structures such as pillars, holes, fingers, and uh, other structures. And we found that through a visual examination that the pillar structures demonstrated the most reliably, uh, demonstrated to be the most reliably printable. Uh, so, and we found that the feature resolution was about 150 microns uh, with a separation uh, required about 300 microns. So, we can see on this uh, picture here of the uh, test structure, we have 250 micron pillars uh, in close proximity to each other. So, we can see some imperfections in the printing, including smearing and a linkage between the uh, different pillars. So, in rea uh, when we're in the final production of the lens, we can ex we ex we've designed that so that the pillars are much farther uh, apart from each other than what is shown here. Uh, since the uh, 3D printed material is actually a proprietary medium, uh, we um, measure the permittivity of the material so that we can do optimizations with its with regards to its optical properties. So we measure the S parameters um, between uh, two planar blocks of the materials with different thicknesses using a vector uh, network system. And the primitivity calculation uh, was based on the uh, phase change between the blocks of two different thicknesses, which gave us the primitivity values for this particular uh, uh, 3D printing resin. So we can see uh, at our design frequencies of 75 to 110 gigahertz, it has a monotonic uh, decay of from 11 to in terms of permittivity. Now we'll switch over to Isaac for the design process. Yeah, so I'm just going to go over briefly how we actually design the lens. So basically what we're, what we're, the, the way that we actually produce the focusing effect from the lens is by controlling this the, the phase shift of the light that's transmitted through the lens. Um, so it's actually kind of well known in the literature that the, uh, the phase shift that you need, the light needs to pick up going through the lens in order to get the focusing effect is to this equation, so you can see it's proportional to the distance from the center of the lens, which is the big R squared. Um, so, and then it's proportional also to the frequency and inversely proportional to the focal length, which is the, the small f and the big f, respectively. Um, so in order to design a lens, we take this, this formula for the phase shift that we need. We break the lens up into a bunch of little cells, and we assign a phase shift to each cell. Um, so you can see we've kind of broken it up and discretized it into cells. And then for each cell, we'll design a, um, a structure, so a pillar structure similar to ones that you saw in the, in the previous slide, um, that will produce this desired phase shift. Um, and then that will, in theory, should produce a lens. So how do we get from step two to step three here? Well, we use simulation. So in particular, we use this, uh, S, this simu a simulation software called S4. Um, so it's a rigor it uses a rigorous wave coupled, or, sorry, rigorous coupled wave analysis um, which is a kind of software technique for simulating the propagation of waves through um, uh, dielectric structures. Um, so in particular, it just looks at the propagation of different modes through the structures. And it, you, you can, from, from this information, we can calculate the, fa the phase shift of the light passing through the structures. Um, so you can see in these two plots, these are the results that we obtained basically doing a parameter sweep of the, so of the height and the radius of the pillars. Um, so these are the, the the radius and the height are kind of so that we are kept within what we are allowed to do or what we were able to print with the 3D printer that we discussed earlier. Um, and you can see on the left, this is the efficiency. So this is how much light is transmitted through. So red is really, really, most light goes through. Green is not so much. And then on the right is what we're most worried about, which is the phase. Um, so that's basically how much phase the, the light, the, the radiation picks up as it goes through the lens. Um, we also confirm these results with another software called ANSYS HFSS. Um, and the reason we did this is because it uses a different technique, so it uses a finite element uh, numerical method. Um, so this is actually solving Maxwell's equation. So unlike S4, um, this is a, an exact solution of, or numerical solution of Maxwell's equation other than the discretization of breaking up into, into cells. Um, and so this kind of confirms, so you can see the, the, the contour plots, uh, you can see on this graph, so that the, the color is the phase that we get from S4 and the contour plots are what we get from um, uh, from HFSS, so as you can see, they're, they're very similar. This is at 100 gigahertz. 
Um, oh yeah, and you can see this in this animation, this is basically what you get out of the simulation. So the, the arrow, or the, yeah, it's a bit hard to see on the projector I'm realizing, but the, the arrows are the kind of the electric field, the red is a stronger electric field you can see. So some, it's coming out from the bottom, it's interacting with the pillar in the middle, and some of it's making it through to the other side. And from this we can extract the phase shift. Um, but okay, so then how do we get from the phase shift to the actual lens design? So we have this equation that we talked about, um, that we just talked about. So this is, so if we were looking at the, so we're assuming there's a, there's a bunch of cells that we want to look at. The RI is the distance from the center of lens for the i cell. Uh, so we know that we want this, this phase shift and it will in general depend on the frequency as well. Um, we then use kind of a least square. So the, the, we want a phase shift, which is the e to the i delta phi that we discussed earlier. And then we have their transmission or the transmission amplitude from the simulation that we got. And this will depend on the RI and the HI, which are the radius and the height. I mean, this here, I'm not sure what's going on with that, but anyway. Um, yeah, it should, oh, there we go. Um, yes, so then we will try, basically for each cell, we try to adjust the RI and the HI so that, the, um, so that this number is as small as possible because that means that we're as close as possible as we can get to the uh, desired transmission. Um, there's another kind of wrinkle here in that we're only interested in the relative phase between the different pillars on the lens. So we can actually add this global kind of fudge factor. So this is the delta F you can see at the top. Um, and this is just kind of an extra degree of freedom that we can optimize over to get the best possible um, result from the lens. Um, so then we will sum over all the frequencies because we're interested in a broadband uh, uh, response of the lens. So we want the, this lens to work from all the way from 75 to 110 gigahertz. So we will sum over all the frequencies that we simulated. And then if we sum over all of the different, um, all the different cells in the lens, then this is kind of our cost function and we will try to optimize this uh, to get our lens in the end. Um, so as you can see, so this is actually kind of an idea of a simulation. So as the number of iterations increase, you can see the cost function, which is that function, complicated function in the previous slide. As, as the number of iterations progresses, it gets better and better and better until it reaches a minimum and then this, the optimization stops. And you can see we go from something with a completely uniform uh, pillars to something that looks much more complicated, um, which is the optimized lens. Um, and what's kind of neat is you can actually kind of see what's going on. So towards the center of the lens, there's very little phase shift that's required. So on the left here is the pillar radius and on the right is the pillar height. Um, so yeah, in the center is very little phase shift required. And then as you go out towards the edges, you need more and more phase shift. Um, so there, therefore this optimization algorithm increases the pillar radius and the pillar height. And eventually you get to, at some point you get to a two pi um, phase shift and then it goes back to zero because you kind of just wrap around. Um, but crucially this kind of occurs at different distances for different frequencies. So the algorithm kind of adjusts for that by changing the radius and the height at kind of different areas. So it, uh, it, it's kind of interesting that it works out like that. So then after we, after we do this, we actually produce lenses, which you can see outside in our booth if you want to walk around afterwards. Um, and then we evaluate the prototype. So how do you evaluate a lens? Well, it's with using a measurement called a uh, point spread function. Um, so basically this is our setup. So essentially you have a, what's called a vector network analyzer. So it's essentially a, uh, a source of terrorist radiation and a detector all kind of rolled into one. Um, so we have the, the source on one, one end, we have a normal um, HDPE uh, uh, terrorist lens. And then we have, that takes, takes light, focuses it onto a pinhole. And this, so basically the, the pinhole will act as, ideally as a point source of uh, terrorist radiation. We then, two focal lengths away, we place our metal lens. And another two focal lengths away, we'll place our detector. And then we can actually move the detector around and map the intensity distribution of the, of the light uh, as a function of position. So this gives us something like this. So from left to right, top to bottom, this is at the intensity distribution measured at 80, 90, uh, 100, and 110 gigahertz. Um, the color indicates the intensity of the radiation. So I think the, it's easiest to see at 90 gigahertz, we got the, the best reaction. You can see there's a nice bright spot, right in the bright, bright yellow spot right in the middle there. Um, at, other, at some other frequencies, so for example, at uh, 100 gigahertz here, you can see the spot is much uh, larger than, um, than that 90 gigahertz. And it was sort of a well-defined spot at 110 and a bit of a mess at 80. Um, so looking at our data, if we, look, if we try to um, yeah, evaluate our design, um, so in terms of 
we were able to design a lens. As you can see from the, from the previous slide, the, the lens does seem to focus the radiation. Um, however, in terms of our requirements for the, uh, the um, spot size, uh, the full width half maximum is probably is still too is not probably is still too large. Um, or it's larger than our than our requirements, so there's still quite a bit of optimization work to do. Um, and in terms of focusing efficiency, unfortunately, due to time constraints, we were not able to measure the actual or to properly calibrate our setup to properly properly measure the power. Um, so that's still a bit of a question mark at the moment. Um, yeah. So which kind of brings us to our next steps. So I think the probably the most important thing that we'd have to do next is uh, have a improve our characterization setup. So our, our point spread function, um, so it's at the moment the, the de de detector is kind of manually rastered, which is very time consuming. Um, and uh, we would need to properly calibrate it to properly assess our, whether we're meeting our requirements or not. Um, another thing, if we wanted to further improve our design, um, would be to try more complex shapes. So obviously this very simple cylindrical pillar gives us two parameters to play with. If we use more more complicated shapes in our um, unit cell, we can get we have more parameters to play with. We, in theory, should be able to optimize the lens uh, better than just with uh, with the, the cylindrical pillars. Um, additionally, what would be useful uh, is to investigate uh, better methods for manufacturing the lens because three D printing, while it's very good for us for prototyping, it's very fast. Uh, it gives us good resolution. It's not ideal for manufacturing. Um, so you, we want to in investigate a process like uh, imprint lithography, which is basically fancy injection molding, uh, in order to, if you want to actually produce these devices uh, for the mass, mass market. Um, yeah, these are our references, and any questions?